Thank you, Lord. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Now, some of us got the memo this morning about wearing Hawaiian shirts. Trouble is, the ones who are not wearing the Hawaiian shirts are looking cooler than the ones that are, but anyway. But we're all dressed up. But when we stand before the throne, we will be dressed in his attire, his righteousness alone. It doesn't matter how good a person you've been, how bad a person you've been, your works, all the things you thought you were doing to win brownie points with God will, will count for nothing. We will be dressed in his righteousness. It'll be a glorious day, won't it? We'll all be admiring the Lord. Saying, oh, you look good. Oh, you look good. Oh, you look good. Amazing because of the precious blood of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross. That when we accept that sacrifice, Lord, we can be dressed in his righteousness alone. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats for a moment. Not too many announcements at this time of the year. Again, the offering buckets are at the door if you're cash givers and little envelopes there. Just a little announcement I wanted to make. I have a friend um, in Uganda. Uh, he's called Dawson. Uh, this chap many years ago, maybe six, seven years ago now, I was speaking at a conference in Uganda, and this chap was one of the interpreters. And I hadn't realized he was a pastor also. I just thought he was there helping to interpret. But after this, I had spoken, I was speaking uh, on Christian business uh, principles, and he said to me, will you send me everything you have? Will you send me all your PDFs, all your PowerPoints, and everything you have on Christian business, which I did. And since then, he has built a bio farm. He's built a school with something like 1,500, 1,600 kids in it. He's bringing people from all over Uganda, training them how to maximize the ground. There's great ground there, but maybe a lack of agricultural skills. He's bringing people in, people of faith, people of Muslim folk, people of no faith. And they start every morning with prayer and Bible study and worship. And many people who are coming to do the training are are getting saved. It's tremendous work he's doing. He actually won a prize from the government for the work he's doing. And so he sent me a message recently to say they're on lockdown and many of the families then, when they're in lockdown there, the government are not sending them food parcels. And so some of these people are actually starving and their families are starving. And so he was saying that a gift of $40 will feed a family of four to five, maybe six for 10 days, and then the hope that the lockdown will be over in, in a short space of time again and people can get back to work. So I, I already sent them some money during the week. But if you would like to share in that and support that, and you would like to give a gift, say, let's say 30 pounds in our money, if you'd like to give 30 pounds or a multiple of that, if you would put it in the offering envelopes, uh, and maybe just mark Uganda or Mission, something like that on it, then it'll not get confused with our tithes and offerings. If you want to give something more substantial, you can see me and I can get the, the bank details. But this is a chap who's doing an awesome work for God. And, and these are people who are in, there are people here in need, but these people will die if they don't get food in some cases. So it's a very different level of poverty. So just think about that, pray about that, ask the Holy Spirit what he would have you do. Also this week then we have our uh, event with Andy and Candy Moon and, and uh, Catherine. So Andy, just remind everybody with that, please. Yeah, just to keep you um, up to speed. So Friday night, we're booking up rightly for Friday night. So if you haven't booked for our little night of, it's going to be fun music from the 50s, 60s and 70s, some old hymns, just to let you see, experience, to have the Candy Moon experience that uh, care homes are having. Funny, we were up at a little... A disability um, unit in uh, Castle Dawson yesterday had a fantastic day. So we want to share with you some of the work that we do and the music that we play. Have a fun night. It's going to be a night where you can get to sing along, hopefully enjoy the stuff, maybe bring some memories back for you. Um, and you'll just, I think you'll have a good time. So we're just raise awareness and you can donate on the night, but there's no pressure to do that. We just want to just share what we do with you. But you got a book, okay? So you probably have emails already. If you haven't responded, then get responding because the seats are filling up and we want you to, to get here. And if you want to bring some friends, please do that and let us know.
you'll find that on the church Facebook page if you haven't got a link already. I think those are all the announcements. I'm going to hand over to the team again. Let's stand again as we continue to worship. Thank you.
sink in a little moment I'm no longer a slave to fear if we ever lived in a season where there was opportunity to be fearful it's now with pandemics and pandemics and furloughs and words we've had to learn that we've never heard before and yet we no longer are slaves to that fear no matter what's going on no matter what the circumstances we can have the peace of God in our hearts knowing that he is watching out for us that he gives his angels charge over us to watch over us and that promise that all things all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose, those who love God. So Father, we thank you today that we can stand, we can sit here with your peace in our hearts, knowing that your perfect love casts out fear. Lord of the enemy would try to bring fear into our lives, just help us to realize as we resist him, he has to flee from us. We thank you for the power of the name of Jesus. We thank you for the covering of the precious blood. We thank you that your name is writ large over our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Thank you, guys awesome thank you maybe we'll put the house lights on i like to see the whites of people's eyes uh, when i'm speaking just to remind you there is the the baby room and the toddler's room in there and uh, the message is fed through there again welcome if you have come in since the service started welcome to those who are watching online mary it says is listening on Stanline. so say hello to mary hello mary Mary and the family are away to a family wedding. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go. You'll just have to take that at face value. Kids are staying in today, uh, but you'll be back. Glad to know, kids, you're back to Sunday school next week. And youth uh, are maybe in for a week or two yet. I'm not sure what's happening there. But uh, different folks are on holidays. If you have been on holiday, I hope you've had a good time. If you're going this week, I hope you get well rested and refreshed and relaxed. Uh, we, met, we met the Cook family in Morelli's. Great place to bump into somebody. And uh, so I know lots of you have been taking a few days away at a time. And so please... Uh, enjoy that and watch the water. Be very careful. So I'm going to speak today. We're doing more one-offs. We had a great message last week from Karen. Thank you, Karen. It was awesome. I know many of you were blessed uh, by that and encouraged by that. And so we'll have different folks speaking throughout uh, the month. And so you're not going to see just as much of me and my Hawaiian shirt. You'll be glad to hear. Uh, I could have got arrested for wearing a loud shirt in a built-up area, but anyway. Uh, so I'm going to speak today, and I'm going to answer the question that has been causing you sleepless nights. I'm going to answer the question that you've been wrestling with all your life. What's so special about mile two? Has that been something that's keeping you awake? Every day. Well, at least Andy's been kept awake. Maybe some of you are saying, this boy's lost the plot. He's been out in the sun too much. What is he talking about? And yet, this is something, this was a concept that Jesus introduced to his listeners that was radical. So we should be thinking about it because it's a radical thought, a radical idea that Jesus brought to his listeners. So we're going to, whether you've been asking the, the question or not, we're going to try and answer it uh, briefly today. I better start my timer or Rachel will be given off. 
I've put five minutes left. Where is Rachel? I'll put five minutes less on it. And so Jesus said, and, and I've gone to the next slide, in, in Matthew 5, 41, he said, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. It's a good word, isn't it? Twain. You see, we've had a lot of talk about the Irish language and Ulster Scots and people's history. I think, I think Jesus was maybe a wee bit of Ulster Scots there. Now, you say, well, why does he say that? Well, when I was a little boy, my uh, grandparents and my dad lived in a place called Slat. Has anybody been in Slat? It's divine. Spelled S-L-A-U-G-H-T. And so it's just outside Ballymena. And, and so my grandfather was quite a serious man, but he, he uh, sometimes we went up to visit. So I remember, I was probably around eight years old at the time, I remember going up with my parents and saying to my grandfather, so what were you doing today, Granda? And he said, I was doing it at the water and caught twa trout. And I said, right, great. You were down at the water and caught twa trout. What is he talking about? And of course, there's a Balamina, there's a wee bit of Ulster Scots in there, but that was the word twain that's coming from that word twain. Twa was two. I always think, was this French? Didn't know French at that stage. Twa, un deux, twa. That's all the French I know. And, and so he, he, that was his down at the water and caught twa trout. Down at the river and caught two trout. So the language here is interesting and maybe. For some of you who have come to faith recently, you read this sort of thing, think, what is Jesus on about here? The voice may, simplifies a little bit, but doesn't give us the full picture. It said, if someone forces you to walk with him for one mile, walk with him for two instead. Well, why would somebody, has anybody in this room or watching online ever been forced to walk two miles with somebody against their, one mile with somebody against their will. Generally, it's not. You're not walking down the street and someone saying, you're going to come and walk with me one mile. It generally doesn't happen. So there's more to this than meets the eye when you just read it uh, at surface level. And so the, the common English version helps us understand it a little bit more and sets it in the culture and the context of what Jesus was actually saying. He said, and if a soldier forces you to carry his pack for one mile, carry it for two. This was a real radical thought because the people he, who he was uh, speaking to, uh, Palestine was, was in, had been invaded and was ruled by the Romans. Uh, and so they were the occupying force. And so the people were believing for the Messiah. There was a lot of zealots. There was a lot of groups who were rising up to try and fight the Romans. The last thing, you imagine in Northern Ireland, there's certain places in Northern Ireland, if, you, if the rule was that you had to carry a British soldier's pack for a mile, be riots, wouldn't there? Be burning. The, so nothing has changed. We, un, we understand that this idea here of, of the po of politics. So Jesus is really stepping into a world that really is messing with these people's head. He says, if a soldier, the occupying force, forces you to carry his pack for one mile, carry it for two. You see, under Roman occupation, you could, if you were able-bodied, you could be compelled to carry their pack and their gear for 1,000 Roman steps, paces. Now, a Roman pace was two steps. I don't know if we'll go out a camera shot here, but it wasn't just one, it was one, two. That was a Roman uh, pace. And so you a thousand of those paces, you, if you were compelled to do it, you had to do it. Otherwise, you could have been beaten, you could have been fined, you could have been put in jail. That was the law. Or as Inspector Cluser says, the law. And, and so, but on that thousandth step, you could just drop that pack. Now, here's a little picture of what, hopefully you can see that online and Maybe this soldier, this is a soldier in all his kit. Imagine this was like his home on his back. So he had his, he had his bed, he had his food, he had his weapons, he had his toiletries, he had everything he needed to do what he was doing. Because uh, he was away from home, he may have been away from barracks. And, and this pack weighed between 40 and 50 kgs. The 40 and 50 kgs is eight stone. 
Any, anybody here weighed themselves? Anybody here ate stone around eight stone? There's a lady at the back. Would you like to carry that lady for a mile on your back? Some of you ladies were about to put your hand up there, but you knew I would say, catch yourself on, love. <laughs> eight stone. <laughs> Last time you seen that was I don't know where. Anyway, imagine carrying, it's, it's the equivalent of two in old money half hundredweight, in Joe's terms, half hundredweight bags of potatoes or 25 kg bags of potatoes. I'm, a, I'm in the manufacturing business. And so now there's very few 25 kg bags have reduced it to 16 kgs for health and safety because people are as weak as water. And so, oh, 16 kgs. Imagine carrying three lots of 16 kgs or two lots of 25 or eight stone for one mile. Uh, and so, uh, a Roman mile was 1,481 meters in length, Some, something similar to what uh, our mile system is today. The Romans were the people who invented this. It was a great system because if you knew if it was 100 miles to the next place and you were at mile 60 mile marker 60 you knew you had 40 miles to go or you're coming the other way you knew the opposite was true brilliant system which we use today some places have miles some places have kilometers but mile markers if you go to the states they're big into their their mile markers i thought this was interesting because jesus is saying if someone compels you to walk one mile walk two the romans believed that walking two of these ancient roman miles constituted the the perfect amount of exercise needed by the body on a daily basis. Isn't that amazing? So we do, we think we're all cool. We have our thing. We need to do 10,000 steps and we put our, our Fitbit or our watch on or our phone. And so 10,000 steps is five miles. But the reason we do five miles today is because we're all sitting on our backside all day in front of a computer or we have more sedentary lifestyle. These people were more agrarian. They were farmers. They were workers. They were, so two miles was plenty of extra exercise because they were already fit. So the Romans believed two miles was this perfect amount of exercise. It's an interesting. We've been talking about the whole person. Now, Jesus has given us a, a spiritual concept here, but even in giving us that spiritual concept, there's a natural application that the second mile is the mile that's going to get you fit and keep your body working. So I, I just loved that. When I read that yesterday, a third, couple of days ago, I thought, that's quite amazing. Anyway, this story, Jesus said, this person is compelling you to walk this mile. It means to be a courier. You were carrying the pack. It means to be pressed into public service. So you weren't a volunteer. You were a conscript. Uh, and so a bit like in the, the days in the army where you, you were cons uh, scripted into the army. You didn't have any choice, same principle. We actually see, we know the story of, uh, we see this, and the, even the kids will know this from Sunday school days. Uh, when Jesus was carrying the cross, a man named Simon from Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Isn't that an interesting detail to put in? Why would you put that detail in? Uh, this is the expanded version, and it sort of expands it. A little bit. The, a man named Simon from Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, probably two Christians known to Mark's readers, was coming from the countryside to the city. The soldiers forced him to carry the cross of Jesus. So this was this conscript, and this was forcing, this was compelling. In this case, it wasn't carrying the soldier's pack, but it was carrying the cross. And so when this was written in, in Mark. When Mark was writing this, Mark was writing 40 years after the event. So Rufus and Alexandra, probably, or Alexander, were probably in their 50s. And so there's a school of thought that these boys who were with their dad, who saw their dad carrying the cross of Jesus, who then, as we go on to see, potentially could have been at the the, the, the day of Pentecost, uh, he was from Libya. If you go on to that next little slide, it says he was an African man, Simon, a native of Libya. So Serene, if you want to get your uh, head around what part of the world is that, it's, it's part of, it was part of Libya in those days. But 
when you look at the day of Pentecost, you see that there was, it says there was all sorts of people here. They said, what, what are these people? What is this? We hear all these people speaking in our own languages. There's people from Pontius and Asia and Egyptians, Libya from Cyrene. I wonder, was that Simon? Was that his two sons? And then later on in the scriptures in Romans, you, you see, and I think, and this is many years later, you see the apostle Paul speaking to the Romans, and he says, greet Rufus. Now, it could have been a different Rufus. We don't know, but isn't it interesting? I just love the threads that flow through the scriptures here. This man was compelled to carry the cross. Then we see those from Libya and Cyrene in the day of Pentecost. Maybe they accepted the Lord. Maybe they came to faith, were filled with the Spirit. And here, a number of decades later, we see the Apostle Paul greet Rufus, for he's especially chosen by the Lord. Sometimes we think we're the, we're the deal. Sometimes it's our children. We focused always on Simon, don't we? We always focus on Simon. Most people couldn't even tell you the, the names of Simon's kids. But here we have Paul saying, this person's chosen. Your kids are chosen of the Lord. Never underestimate the power of children, the power of what God is doing in their lives, the anointing he has in their lives. And greet his mother. His mother, mother wasn't mentioned in the earlier stories with Jesus, but and greet his mother who was like a mother to me. So here we find in this story, whilst Jesus is saying, if a person compels you to walk one mile, walk with them too. It means before they compelled you, before they forced you, you were at mile zero. Does that make sense? Are my mathematics good? If not, I need to get out of business. So mile zero is our choice. We're merrily going about, whether you're a Christian, whether you're not a Christian, that's your choice. You're just doing life, loving life, doing your thing. Uh, and so uh, let's go on to the next little slide there. See, many people... They don't want to carry a burden. They don't want to have responsibility. They just want to do their own thing. They think, I'm, I'm free and easy. I'm at mile zero. I'm going to set my camp up at the side of the road. No responsibilities, no mortgage, no this, no that. I'm just going to party and have a good time and enjoy life. Next little slide just shows us people going about, hopefully you can see it at the back, doing our own thing. And there's lots of people, Christians, and non-Christians, there are lots of Christians do their own thing. They don't go to church. They don't tithe. They don't fellowship. Well, I gave my life to the Lord 20 years ago, and I worship, don't worship creation, but I walk in the mountains, and that's close to God. That's great to do that. But the Bible says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together because that's where you're going to learn. That's where you're going to be disciplined. That's where you're going to be loved. That's where you're going to be pastored. That's where you're going to be cared for. So there's areas of responsibility. Mile zero is great for a season if you're 18. But life has responsibilities. Life has things we do have to carry. And so mile one in Jesus' story is someone else's choice. You see, they were compelled. The Roman soldier came along and said, you're carrying this pack for 1,000 double paces or else. Uh, and so it's somebody else's choice. Uh, and so maybe we feel a little bit like this image on the screen uh, where we're, we're being manipulated, we're being controlled by someone else. Uh, and so sometimes in life, if, we, if you look at that, hopefully you can see that online, this person who's been trying to cut the strings. Sometimes these responsibilities, some are good. Some responsibilities are good. We're built for responsibility. We're actually built for work and worship. We're built to carry a burden. We're built to carry a load. But some of those loads are false burdens. Some of them are burdens that we weren't meant to carry. What did Jesus say? Take my yoke upon you uh, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He didn't say we're doing away with the yokes and the burdens. He said, no, they're, we're built for yokes and burdens but we're built for the right types of yokes and burdens. There's an anointing of ease comes with, with the yoke and the burden that Jesus gives us. It's a very different thing. And so some of these things in mile one are good. Some are not so good. Some we can change. Don't go home today and say, 
my husband's controlling me and uh, I wish, blah, and I ain't getting a divorce because the pastor said, get out of mile one. No, don't, I'm not saying that. There, there's, there's things, might be your wife's controlling the husband's maybe saying, it'd be more likely that, wouldn't it? Some we can change, some we can't change. You know, I, I don't know if you've seen the article a while back on, on the TV where across the UK there are tens of thousands of children caring for their parents. I don't know if you've seen that program, an astonishing program. Kids as young as maybe nine, ten years old into their early teens and because of uh, maybe a, a single parent family and because the parent has taken ill, those kids are having to dress and feed their kids. Then they go to school. Then they come home to look after their parents. Something forced upon them, something thrust upon them that sh shouldn't be something a child has to carry. A and yet that's real life. And so sometimes there are things thrust upon us. We're forced to carry loads that we don't choose to. Sometimes we carry those false loads that we need to, to let go. Jesus' command then in, in the setting, as I've said already, would have shocked his Jewish audience because they're just saying, how do we get these Romans out? How do we, let's pray that the Messiah comes. They're, they're expecting Jesus to be a king who's going to rid the, the Palestine and Jerusalem of, the, of these oppressors. And so the response to his... Uh, idea that when you're forced to go one mile you go a second mile that that's something you do willingly uh, so the, the occupation was starkly different from the other Jewish activists there were many activists at this, that time many people claiming to be messiahs uh, and so uh, Jesus goes against all the theories and all the feeling and the emotion of the day Jesus is telling them this extra mile, this mile two, is something you get to do, not something you have to do. Mile one is something you have to do, otherwise you'll be fined, beaten, put in jail. But mile two is something you get to do. It's your choice. It's something that you can enjoy. We're back to, to our choice again. So mile zero is our choice, but we're just wasting our lives. We're just drifting in mile two, we're back to our choice. We're making choices that are godly choices. We're making choices that Jesus wants us to make. It brought me to, uh, as, as you know, if you know me long enough, I, I love words. And these two words popped into my head. They're very, very similar. Between these two words, there's only a 20%. There's 20% of a difference with two letters uh, in this, uh, these words. One is obligation. And one is oblation, not ablution. Ablution is something different. Oblation. And, and so obligation means an act or course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound. That sums up my one, doesn't it? These people were forced into doing this. It was a legal thing they had to do. They were morally conscripted to do it. It's a duty or a commitment some will have to do, to have to put the bins out, to have to cut the grass, to have to that think there's things in life that are obligations. But an oblation is an offering, something very different. The word's very close in their structure, but it means to bring something near the altar. What does the Bible say? We should be living sacrifices. It means a sacrificial present. It means to be ready. Remember when the prophet, uh, God spoke to the prophet and he said, here am I, send me. He was ready. He didn't say, here am I, send somebody else. Here am I, send me. That's the oblation, the offering of your life. That's a mile to mentality. Colossians 3 just really summarizes this so beautifully. It says, so no matter what your task is, work hard. Always do your best as the Lord's servant. Don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Work for, from the heart for your real master, for God. Confident that you will get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Now, this was written to slaves. 
this passage. This wasn't written to free men. It was written to slaves, but it applies to all of us. And so the writer wasn't saying, try and get away from the master. Try and get away from, try and buy yourself out of that. He was saying, whatever you're doing, do it unto to God. Uh, and I think King James says, do your work not as men pleasers, but unto the Lord. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. The sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Yeah, I've had to sack three people. Maybe I had to sack more. But in my lifetime in business, I've had to sack three people uh, for stealing and they were all claiming to be Christians. It's quite scary, isn't it? So being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Doesn't, you can't say, oh, well, sure, he's a Christian, I'm a Christian, he's plenty of money and I haven't, so I just help myself. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and so we need to realize whatever we do in life, we have to have this mentality. We're doing it unto the Lord. And this is what the Lord said to these people. You may be carrying this for a Roman soldier, but you're actually doing this for God. You're doing this. God's teaching you something in this. You're doing this. You may, it may speak to this person, your willingness, your joyfulness in doing it, your, your attitude in doing it. Here's a good Irish word. Mile one is about begrudgery. And look this up in the dictionary. It said this is, a, this is an Irish word. That sounds like an Irish word, doesn't it? Begrudgery. It's doing it with resentment. And how often do we do stuff? Mm, I'm the, the rota in church. I have to do the car park. I have to. Do the, they're asking for money again. We don't ask for money very often. But, but you know, people have those attitudes around the world. And, and, and so you're not going to get the best. You're not going to be blessed with that. Whatever it is in work or where, wherever it is. So mile one's about begrudgery. Mile two is about attitude as much as action. In fact, it's about attitude more than action. If we get our attitude right, if we're doing this willingly, if this is something we get to do. Imagine when I was a fish and chip man, as many of you know, and God spoke to me so clearly about planting a church. Imagine if I was trying to do this with a mile one mentality. God's called me to be a pastor. What a I wanted to be a chip man. I was making plenty of money and blah, blah, blah. And now I have to look after all these people. And God told me to start a food bank. For goodness sake, you think I have nothing better to do? How long is that? How long are you going to? It, that'll wipe you out. And so whatever God's calling us to do, we need, we, we need a mile to attitude. It's as much about attitude as it is about action. It's about a, a generosity of spirit in our family, in our workplace. You know, here's the interesting thing about it. If you have this generosity of spirit in your workplace, if you have a mile two mentality, you'll get, you'll get rewarded. You'll get promotion. Just chatting to somebody earlier this morning, and really it ties in with this about how being adaptable and how having more than one string to your bow, you get opportunities that other people aren't going to get. And so a generosity of spirit in our family, in our workplace, in our community. This is why we started our community work, because we wanted to display that mile to mentality. In our ministry, in our church, in missions. You know, we could, when my little friend in, in Uganda, I would have to say, does send me lots of texts looking for money. But I can oversee that because I know the situation he's in. And so I could say, well, hold on, we have enough problems here. Why would I send money over there? Well, it's because it's a mile two attitude. It's an attitude of appreciating what we do have. And this is something we get to do. We get to minister beyond us for and no more. It's to do with our giving. Uh, it's not about, oh, well, I've paid my tithe. Well, no, it's about having that generous, that overflow of tithes and offerings and alms and lots of different things that the Bible teaches us. G uh, Paul said, you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. We're not doing it for the reward. We're doing it as unto the Lord. But here's the, here's the amazing thing. When you do it with the right attitude, there's a reward at the end. 
You ever, in our own natural lives, when people don't ask you for anything, you're more inclined to give them something, aren't you? But when they're always rhyming on, can I have this? Can they think with kids? Can I have this? Can I have that? Can I have the other thing? Think about husbands and wives. Not to blame the kids. We're all the same. Can I have this? Can I get that? Can I have the other thing? But when people don't ask, when people don't demand, we're more entitled to give them, aren't they? Aren't we? And so here Jesus saying, listen, you're not doing it to get a reward. Or Paul's saying, you're not doing it to get a reward. You're doing it to please God. But there's an inheritance comes with it, which is uh, really encouraging. And maybe in those difficult days helps us press through. Mile two is where the blessing is. You know, for, for Mary and I, it's been such a blessing to do what we've been doing now for over 20 years. When I look at people who've come to faith, when I look at people growing in their faith, when I look at people who've been helped through the community work, it just is humbling. It's just such a joy. It's not something we have to do. It's something we've had the privilege of partnering with God in. And each one of us have our own version of that. It's a place of peace and contentment. Mile two is a place of peace and contentment. We've given up the fight. We're stop, we stop fighting God. We're doing it willingly. It's a place of joy and then strength because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So if, you, if you're feeling weak, get into joy. Get into some serving. Get into some worship. Get into some help in someone else. There'd be a strength that will come to your life. It's a place of satisfaction. You know, I find this interesting. Mary and I have been in a few of these courses where they're all trying to psych you out and you have to do role play and you have to write things and we post it and stick, it up, stick them up on the wall. Anybody ever been in any of those things? Uh, I'm not that keen on them, but sometimes you have to go. And so I have to get a mile two attitude. And so we've been in a couple of these over the years and it's interesting. One of the questions and a couple of them, they ask, if you won the... They ask it two ways. If you knew this was your last week in life and you were going, to, Jesus was returning in a week or you were going to die or whatever, or you win the lottery. Those are the two. The, the options are quite opposite to each other, aren't they? If this was your last week or you, you won the lottery, what would you do? And so Mary, and, Mary was down one end of the room, I was another. So out of the 30 people, 28 of them wrote, I would tell the boss where to go. I have to remember there's kids in. Uh, I'd tell the boss where to go and I would retire or I'd buy a big yacht or I'd buy a house in Spain or I would do this, that and the other thing. Uh, most of them said they would give up their work. Uh, very One or two said, well, I would give 10% to charity. Mary and I, both independently of each other, on two different occasions, wrote, we would just keep doing the same thing because we found our bullseye. That's a place of satisfaction. That's a place of peace and contentment. And that's what God has for each one of us. If your answer to that question is, oh, well, I tell you, I would change things. You need to begin to change things without knowing there's a week left of your life or without thinking you're going to win the lottery. Change them now. But change them with a, a mile or two mentality. Because as you... Journey through life in every sphere of life with a mile to mentality. You'll find things will change. Your attitude will change. You'll think things out there will change. But when your attitude changes, things out there will change. And your life will take on a whole new dimension called the mind to dimension. So for all of you who were asking, what's mile to all about? Now you know. Thank you for listening.